going live. You are live. Good evening. On behalf of Texas Accountants and Lawyers for the Arts, the El Paso International Music Foundation and Austin Music Foundation, I'd like to welcome you to the Publishing Administration and Getting Paid for Your Songs webinar. Funding for tonight's program and TALA's ongoing services is generously provided by the Texas Commission on the Arts, the National Endowment for the Arts, Mid-America Arts Alliance, and the City of Austin Economic Development Department. This seminar is part one of two parts. When planning this seminar, we realized there was a lot to cover in one setting. So Gwen will be presenting a second night of Monetizing Your Music on Wednesday, July 13th. We encourage you to register for the July seminar to obtain the full content. Both seminars will be available on Tala's YouTube channel for viewing after the presentation. Also, in a timely fashion, the Austin Music Foundation will be presenting a seminar related to tonight's content on July 12th. And I'm gonna let Kate tell you more about that in a moment. Our partners tonight have a common goal of elevating musicians in their respective cities of Austin and El Paso. I'd like to give them a chance to introduce their organizations to you. First up, Eric Bozeman with the El Paso International Music Foundation. Hi, thanks so much for having us. And we feel really honored and privileged to get to be a part of tonight. Um, the El Paso International Music Foundation is a advocacy nonprofit group designed to sort of help musicians in three different areas. One being to empower them through education and specifically about the business side and of the industry that most of us are all real comfortable and happy making art, but not necessarily invested in getting the business side of things handled. So we are really excited about going to come out next. Um, another element that we are about is connecting musicians with mental health and physical health resources. And then the last part is finding opportunities of outreach for musicians to get the opportunity to go out and play, as well as to go out and serve our community and um, do charitable types of things as well. So we're kind of the babies of these organizations that are here, featured here today. We're the new kids on the block, but really excited about what's happening and what's going on with Tala. And thanks so much for tuning in and having us be involved. Thanks so much, Eric. And now Kate Bozeman's going to tell us about the Austin Music Foundation. Hi, thanks for joining us today, everybody. I hope you're all doing good. My name's Kate with Austin Music Foundation, and we're so happy today to be providing promotional support to Tala for this two-part series on monetizing your music. Um, we know as musicians how important it is to be making money from your music, and we're really happy that everybody's here learning and how to how to apply that knowledge to benefit you and the music you make. Austin Music Foundation is a nonprofit art service organization, and our core mission is to strengthen, connect, and advance the local music industry and community. Our goal is to ensure opportunities exist for Austin's creative class to thrive so we can all continue to benefit from the cultural identity, value, connection and happiness music gives us. And this year, as Eric said, being um, the baby of the group, uh, we celebrate 20 years today. So um, I'm actually feeling uh, really old <laughs> in comparison, but that's just the organization. And sorry, not today, it was in February, but this is our 20th year, which is absolutely awesome that we've been in Austin this long. Um, we do have um, a workshop coming up that and Lisa mentioned on July 12th, um, and it is really in line with what you're learning about today. So a uh, webinar is, is called Mechanical Royalties Roundup, a step-by-step -step guide on how to get started with the Mechanical Licensing Collective, the MLC, and that's on Tuesday, July 12th at 12 p.m. CST um, via AMF's Facebook live page and also via Zoom if you register via our website. And this will be an introduction to the Mechanical Licensing Collective and step-by-step -step instructions on how you as songwriters, composers, lyricists, and music publishers can collect all of your US digital mechanical royalties 
Um, and anyone who is entitled to receive digital audio mechanical royalties in the US will need to become a member of the MLC. And I think um, a speaker today, Gwendolyn Seal, will also be mentioning the MLC um, in this two-part series. So if you want a deep dive into the MLC and have the opportunity to ask them questions directly, make sure you tune in to AMS workshop on July 12th. Teller will also be supporting this webinar as well. So thank you, thank you. For more information on our programs, check the link at the bottom. And thank you again so much to Tala and El Paso International Music Foundation for inviting us to partner with you today and for all that you do, and also Gwen as well. Thanks so much, Kate. Will they be able to find information on your website about the July 12th event? They will, yeah. It's all up on the website now, um, mm -hmm. as is um, the workshops as well, the second part to this workshop as well. So they can also go to our website to find out how to um, sign up as well. Okay, perfect. So if you live in El Paso or Austin, make sure you become acquainted with these wonderful organizations. If you live elsewhere in Texas, I'd also recommend keeping track of their activities because they've got online content that you'd be able to access from any location. And I know that they would welcome your participation, even if you're not located in the city that they're in. Moving on to tonight's program. Uh, first of all, if you have questions, uh, please write them in the chat feature. And as a note, we're using YouTube tonight and you have to be logged into your account or your own YouTube channel to access the chat feature. So if you're just watching this and not logged in, you're not going to be able to ask a question. So you may want to log in with your account if you would like to ask uh, Gwen a question directly. I believe she's going to hold questions until the end. So we get through all the content. Um, it's a lot. And so it's very possible that your question may be answered later later anyway. So um, we'll kind of sort that out and see how long it takes. But we are going to try to take questions at the end of tonight's seminar. Uh, tonight's speaker is Gwen Seal, an attorney here in Austin, Texas, with the office of Mike Tolleson and Associates, whose primary practice area is entertainment law. She's a graduate of Austin College and the SNU Dedman School of Law. She's been a TALA volunteer. She served on our board. She's been a good friend to me. She's one of the first people I call when I have questions. She's currently a consultant to our organization and ensures that we're up to current trends and we know what we're doing. And she's providing high quality information to us as staff and our artists and musicians, and we're so grateful to have her involved. Uh, Gwen's published numerous articles and provided education to attorneys, also here in Texas at the State Bar's Continuing Legal Education Program, that all attorneys have to do so much continuing education every year to keep our license, and Gwen is one of those people that keeps us up to date on new trends, especially in the music industry and regarding digital distribution and royalty structures. So tonight you're in really good hands. So we're thrilled she's here to share her work and she's going to sort out the nuances of all these various revenue streams. So Gwen, take it over. Thank you, Elisa. Hi, everyone. Welcome to Publishing Administration and Getting Paid for Your Songs. If you are a songwriter, you are currently in the right place. So some topics that we're going to cover tonight. First, we're going to go over some copyright basics as it relates to songs and music publishing. So everyone's on the same page. We all have adequate foundation as we move forward. Next, we're gonna talk about where you need to plug yourself in as a songwriter in order to receive the various types of royalties that are owed to you. From there, we're gonna move on to the terms and features of the major publishing administration aggregators. And then from there, we will shift over to the mechanics of monetizing your songs on social media. Spoiler alert, there's not a ton of money here, not really much money at all, but it is useful to at least understand um, how uh, royalties work in uh, the realm of social media. Copyright terminology. As I'm sure that y'all are aware, copyright protects original works of authorship fixed in a tangible medium of expression. In the music realm, there are two distinct copyrights at play. On the one hand, you have the musical composition, which is also referred to as the song. This is the copyright that we will be discussing today. Now, one thing that drives me absolutely insane about the music business is the fact that people use multiple terms to refer to the same thing. So as it relates to the musical composition, 
Some people say composition, song, musical work. For me, for the purpose of this presentation and moving forward, I'm just gonna say song because um, that just rolls off the tongue easier. So what is the song? The song consists of the lyrics and the melody. So you write lyrics and melody down on a piece of paper or fix the lyrics and melody in some other sort of tangible form, guess what? You have a copyright, you have a song. You as the person who have written down those lyrics and the melody, you're the songwriter. You are also the music publisher. Now keep in mind, as I said before, this presentation just covers the song, not the separate sound recording copyright. That's what we'll be talking about in two weeks. So let's go over what music publishing is. Music publishing is basically the business management of songs. Now, managing the business around your songs is a really daunting task. And as a result, there are entities out there that will basically do this work for you on your behalf. Now, there are a few types of music publishing arrangements that are available to songwriters. Um, on the one hand, you have the traditional music publisher. And if you're a songwriter and you are in an arrangement with a traditional music publisher, that publisher is going to own or co-own the copyright in your songs. Um, and that party is going to also be really involved in the creative elements of your career. Um, they are going to be possibly helping set you up with other songwriters so you can co-write together. Um, they will also be helping you uh, hone and improve your songwriting skills. A traditional music publisher is also going to have a lot of resources and a lot of connections. So they are going to be actively pitching your songs for cuts, for placements in television or film commercials, and they're going to negotiate all the licenses around the uses of your songs. Further, a music publisher is going to register songs with the proper entities to collect royalties, and they'll also be registering songs with the Copyright Office. And they collect royalties and pay royalties owed to songwriters. Now, I'm presuming that the majority, if not all of y'all, um, are not in agreements with music publishers that own either in whole or in part the copyright in some of or all of your songs. Now, on the other hand, we've got the publishing administrator. And the publishing administrator is going to help you with just the business management. They're not going to be really involved in the creative elements of your songwriter career. Um, the music publishing administrator is not going to own any copyright interest in your songs. Rather, they're just going to take a commission for the work that they do. Some publishing administrators actively pitch songs for uh, placements in TV or film or commercials. Um, when licenses come their way for the uses of songs, they will negotiate those licenses. And um, the publishing administrators will register songs with the proper entities um, and collect and pay out those royalties that are owed. And they also may register songs with the Copyright Office. Now, the aggregator I consider as kind of a different um, animal, which is under the publishing administrator umbrella. The aggregator is really just going to register your songs with the proper entities to collect royalties, and they'll collect them and pay them out to you as the songwriter. The aggregator is basically there to just ingest the information you provide and just make sure that your titles are registered and that you're getting paid your royalties. So um, they're not going to be going out and actively pitching um, your music. They're just there to register and collect the money that is owed to you. And so the aggregators that we will be talking about tonight um, include CD Baby Pro Publishing, Tune4 Publishing, and Song Trust, just because those are the ones that most people I know use. So let's talk about song rights and a couple of the royalty streams that you are entitled to as a songwriter. So on the one hand, we have the mechanical royalty. And the mechanical royalty pertains to the mechanical right, which is the right to reproduce and distribute 
a song in audio format. So mechanical licenses are needed um, and required when songs are released in physical formats like vinyl records, CDs, sold as downloads, or made available through streaming. So who pays these mechanical royalties? It's going to be the record company as it pertains to uh, physical product and permanent downloads. And as it relates to um, streaming, we're talking about the streaming platform is the one that pays. Now, how do you as the songwriter get paid? If you have a music publisher or a publishing administrator or you're using a publishing aggregator service, those parties would be paying you these mechanical royalties. Um, if you don't have a publisher, you're not using an administrator, don't have an aggregator service, and you don't want to use any of those parties, you can collect your streaming, interactive streaming mechanical royalties from the Mechanical Licensing Collective, um, which is a newly established entity that we will talk about in a few slides. Now, who sets these mechanical royalty rates? The Copyright Royalty Board sets these mechanical royalty rates. I'm not going to get into the specifics of the Copyright Royalty Board because that would just add another two hours to this presentation. I'm sure y'all don't want to stay here until like 10 o'clock. Um, but just keep in mind here, it's essentially the government that's setting the rates. Now, public performance royalty, separate from the mechanical royalty. The public performance royalty pertains to the public performance right which is the right to perform songs publicly. Public performance licenses are needed when songs are performed on the radio or TV, venues, um, or streaming services. And so who pays these royalties? Those music users being the terrestrial radio stations, TV stations, venues, streaming services. They license these rights through what are known as performing rights organizations or shortened PROs and pay these license fees. Now, how do you as a songwriter get paid these performance royalties? You get paid these performance royalties through your performing rights organization. Um, some of the performing rights organizations that are um, available in the US include ASCAP, BMI, and CSAC. Keep in mind that with performance royalties, there's a 50-50 split between the writer and the publisher. So when a dollar comes through in performance royalties for a particular song, 50 cents of that would go to the writer, 50 cents would go to the publisher. Now, who sets these performance um, royalty rates? These are set via rate court or um, just negotiated directly by the parties. One thing I wanted to mention about performance royalties that I find a lot of songwriters just don't know about. If you're a songwriter and you also happen to be a performing artist, so you're going out and you're performing live shows, you can earn performance royalties from your live shows by submitting your set list to your performing rights organization. So ASCAP has what's called ASCAP on stage, BMI has what's called BMI Live. And these features allow songwriters to submit their set list from their live shows and get performance royalties um, in exchange. And so when you go and submit these set lists, they'll ask you, when was the show? Uh, what songs were uh, performed at the show? And um, you know, just some basic questions like that, where it was. Now, if you are wanting to know what the submission deadlines look like for these set lists, you can go visit your PRO's website and find out that information. I was able to find BMI's in like less than 30 seconds yesterday. So it's pretty easy to get that information. So as was mentioned earlier, um, Austin Music Foundation is going to be having a webinar on um, the Mechanical Licensing Collective coming up in a couple of weeks. But I at least want to give you all a little bit of an overview before you have this, um, this webinar. Now, what is the Mechanical Licensing Collective? The Mechanical Licensing Collective was selected by the Copyright Office to receive and distribute mechanical royalties for interactive streaming to music publishers and self-published songwriters. And when I say interactive streaming, I'm talking about streaming services whereby you're actively selecting what song um, is being listened to. So like Spotify or Apple, not a situation like 
digital radio where a user isn't actively selecting what song is being, what music is actually being listened to. Um, if you have a music publisher or a publishing administrator, or you're using an aggregator service on the publishing side, those parties should have registered your works for you with the Mechanical Licensing Collective. And one thing that I highly suggest, if you haven't already done so, go check the MLC database to make sure that your works have been registered properly. I can't begin to tell you the amount of times that I've gone on to the MLC database and I've seen wrong information for titles. So, you know, go and make sure that your works are registered properly. Because keep in mind, if you're using an aggregator service, they're representing millions and millions and millions and millions of songs. So it's really easy for mistakes to be made. Now, if you don't have any of the above, so you don't have a publisher, you don't have a publishing administrator, you're not using an aggregator service, you don't want to use any of those sorts of parties, you are um, a self-administered songwriter who can register your songs directly with the MLC and get paid. Um, and you can go and register your songs by going to their website, which is below here on the slide. And um, as I mentioned, the Awesome Music Foundation webinar will give you a lot more information about that too. Now, it is really important to make sure your works are properly registered with the MLC because if they aren't properly registered with the MLC, then you're not gonna get paid your mechanical royalties from these interactive streaming services. And when that happens, these unmatched, unclaimed royalties end up in what's known as black box territory. And black box monies can be liquidated by the MLC beginning three years after the royalties are generated. And when I say liquidated, it means liquidated to all the various publishers via market share methodology. So um, just understand that you just need to register your works properly. So then that way um, you don't end up in a situation where um, you know, your royalties end up being liquidated later on down the line. One other thing I wanted to point out relates to what is referred to as the historical unmatched royalties. Understand that there is nearly a half billion dollars in unmatched mechanical royalties from these interactive streaming services that were paid out by the streaming services to the MLC from uses prior to January 1 of 2021. And so this money right now is sitting at the MLC. Now, the first set of historical unmatched royalty data is now um, in the MLC portal. And um, this first set of data, at least from what I understand, it's not pertaining to like services like Spotify or Apple, but some of like the smaller streaming services. But in any case, if you are um, a member of the MLC, um, you can go in there and uh, check it out, uh, look through this data and submit claims. So um, when you're on that webinar in a couple of weeks, if you have questions about that, I highly suggest asking them. So a few notes on just registering your songs in general. Um, I have songwriters who come to me and say, well, at what point should I register my songs with the PROs? Or um, should I register with my PRO first and then the MLC or vice versa? So my suggestion, if you are a songwriter and you are recording and releasing your own music, I suggest registering your works with your performing rights organization first. Um, your PRO, when you register your work, they will assign the ISWC to your song, which is the International Standard Musical Work Code. That is the unique, permanent, and internationally recognized code for the identification of songs. So it's basically like a social security number for a song, um, and it facilitates getting paid. Because when you think about it, there are lots of John Smiths in the world. Uh, furthermore, there are lots of songs with the same title. So it makes sense to have a unique identifier for a song. So when you register with the PROs, the PROs will assign um, ISWCs to your songs. Further, when you go and register with the Mechanical Licensing Collective, they do cross-reference um, the data that you submit with um, information at the performing rights organizations. Further, the MLC will also uh, inquire about ISWC numbers 
So to me, it just makes sense to register with your PRO first, then move on to um, the MLC. Um, and then when you're thinking about in terms of, do I just wait until I release my music to go ahead with a registration process? I think it makes sense to wait until you've released your music because when you do register your, um, your songs with the PRO, it will also ask about the recording release information if there's any. So it will ask you the length of the recording, um, album titles, things like that. So you'll have all that information, release date, for example, you'll have all that information once um, the release occurs. So just as soon as you release, I suggest going and moving forward with the registration processes. Oh, one other thing. If you are a songwriter who has affiliated with ASCAP, um, you need to make sure that you're affiliated as both a songwriter and as a music publisher if you own and control your own publishing. Um, because with ASCAP, if you aren't also registered, affiliated as a publisher, then you're only going to get paid your writer's share of royalties as a songwriter. Um, BMI, they actually flow through the publisher's share of performance royalties to the songwriter's um, accounts if a songwriter doesn't have a publishing company set up. So um, if you happen to be a songwriter who is uh, just affiliated with ASCAP as a songwriter, you control your publishing, you don't have a publishing company set up with ASCAP, you're leaving basically 50% of your performance royalties um, on the table, which you definitely don't want to do. And it's not a complicated process. You don't have to have a formal legal entity like an LLC or a corporation. They make the process as simple as possible. You know, we'll ask you what you want your publishing company name to be. And then they'll look through their database and make sure that there's no conflicts with other folks who maybe have a, the same publishing company name. And in that case, they'll have you select a different one, different name. So I think it is really useful for songwriters to understand the economics of streaming. Now, um, it's pretty depressing, but I think it's also really useful. So apologies in advance for being the bearer of bad news. Um, that's just kind of, I think, my role in life. So streaming revenues, mechanical royalties for songwriters and music publishers. So understand that as it relates to mechanical royalties in the streaming context, there's not a set mechanical royalty rate per stream. These calculations are all really complicated and the quote rate ends up changing each month depending upon the revenue generated by a particular streaming service and the version of the streaming service that's being used. So for example, in April of 2020, the mechanical royalty rate on Spotify Premium was 0. 0.00059 cents. And if you want to do the math, which is really depressing, that means that it takes 169,325 streams to earn just $100 in mechanical royalties. So yeah, pretty, pretty crazy, right? The case is even worse when we're talking about the free and ad supported version of Spotify. We're talking about 0. 0.0001 cents, meaning that in that context, it takes over half a million streams to just generate $100 in mechanical royalties. Now, compare the streaming part with selling physical product. So if you sell 110 albums with 10 tracks on the album, so let's say you're selling a CD with 10 tracks, that is going to generate $100 in mechanical royalties for the songwriters at the current 9.1 cent rate for physical products. So stark difference there, right? I also wanted to mention that um, the streaming rates um, for the years 2018 to 2022 are currently in litigation. And I have litigation in quotes because litigation at the Copyright Royalty Board doesn't follow the um, federal rules of civil procedure or the federal rules of evidence, kind of like Wild West administrative court proceedings. And due to appeals, um, 
we're basically at the end of 2022 and we don't have the rates that should have been in fact for like the last five years. And um, word on the street is we're supposed to get a decision on the appeal within the next few days. So hopefully there will be um, a significant increase because right now songwriters are being paid at 2012 rates. Furthermore, the streaming rates for mechanical rates for 2023 to 2027 are also simultaneously in litigation. So um, in any event, hopefully um, there will be a good increase of this revenue stream for songwriters, because as you can see from the figures above, well, um, can't really be much worse. I wanted to briefly talk about the use of songs in audiovisual works. Um, so a sync license is a license to use a song in time synchronization with visual images, images. So any party that is wanting to use music in their film, in their TV show, commercials, video games, they're gonna need a sync license from the publisher who controls the song. Now, the feature of the license that everyone, of course, cares about is the fee. And the fees are all over the map and depend on a variety of factors. So some of these factors include, how is the music being used? Are we talking about just in the background where you have characters in the particular TV show that are you know, talking and so the music's not at the forefront, right? So compare that with a very prominent use of music it, as in, the music is really a focal point in the scene. Um, I don't know if any of y'all are a fan of Stranger Things. I'm a huge fan, um, just recently became a fan and just binge watched like the whole thing in just a matter of a few weeks. Um, but a good example of music being used um, as a focal point, um, Kate Bush's Running Up That Hill. So a use like that is definitely going to command a higher fee than just background music where, you know, it's not really, it's ancillary to what's happening in um, the particular scene. Additionally too, demand of the song, of course, is going to impact what the fee is gonna be. Songs that are um, in high demand, that are prominent, written by famous songwriters, uh, performed by famous artists, you know, of course, are gonna command more um, in the way of a sync fee. Now, as independent songwriters, if you happen to also be the recording artist, or if you're in a band where all of y'all are writing songs together and performing songs together, it could be the case that you end up with a license and it covers both sync and master use um, because uh, it just is easier that way because you happen to control both of those copyrights. And you'll see the fee might be referred to as an all-in fee that covers both the sync use, the use of the song, and the master use, the use of the recording. So next we are going to move right along to administering your publishing and talking about some of the prominent publishing aggregators out there like CD Baby Publishing, TuneCore Publishing, and SongTrust. So these aggregators, they're essentially like do-it-yourself publishing administrators. Now, as a songwriter, you can affiliate directly with a PRO to receive your performance royalties. You can also affiliate with the MLC to collect your mechanical royalties from interactive streaming in the US. However, international mechanical royalties or publishing-related royalties from social media services you can't really collect those on your own. As a result, there is a need for these publishing administration services, which um, some of which are done by these aggregators. One thing that I like to examine is the relationships between these aggregators and how the companies work together. So, Understand that CD Baby and SongTrust are both owned by Downtown Music. CD Baby Pro Publishing outsources its publishing administration work to SongTrust. TuneCore Publishing outsources its publishing administration work to Centric. So there are some layers here. So 
when you look at the layers between the money from, let's just say, the streaming services and the songwriter, in the case of TuneCore Publishing, you're looking at the money starting over at Spotify, moving over to a collection agency like the MLC, um, then from there to Centric, then to TuneCore Publishing, then to the songwriter. Similar as it pertains to CD Baby Pro Publishing. Spotify, collection agency like the MLC, Song Trust, CD Baby Pro Publishing, then the songwriter. Now, I've talked to um, higher ups at both TuneCore and CD Baby, and they assure me that you're not getting, it's not like each party is commissioning um, on any of the money that flows through from the streaming services. So that's at least what they're telling me. But one other reason why I wanted to point this out is if you happen to maybe be looking at other sorts of publishing administrators, it could be the case that some of these other companies end up using like a CD Baby Pro Publishing or maybe using a TuneCore Publishing. And so in a case like that, there is then added in another layer between the songwriter and the money. And it's just always my feeling that there should be you know, as least amount of layers between the money and the songwriter as possible. Um, because the more parties, there is a higher likelihood of um, data mistakes because data is constantly being moved around from party to party to party. Um, and further, chances are that um, the money can end up being uh, reduced because everyone's taken a little slice out at a time. So let's take a look at some of the terms of these publishing administration aggregators. So as it comes to the term, CD Baby and TuneCore both use one-year terms. Now with SongTrust, they say you can terminate any time, but that they'll continue to collect for a year after you terminate. It essentially kind of works the same way. They basically do have like a one-year term if they can just continue collecting for a year. Now, as it relates to the setup fee, all of these companies' setup fees kind of will change over time, and sometimes they run specials and promotions, but these were accurate as of a couple of days ago. The huge difference that you'll see here is as it relates to CD Baby, there is a setup fee per album. Um, and one other thing that I have noticed with them is that they try to bundle both distribution and their publishing administration services in one. Um, and I've talked to some songwriters who have said that when they've tried to use other services, like let's say a distro kid, that they're not able to just use CD Baby Publishing on their own. Um, so that's something to you know, think about. If you're using CD Baby on the distribution side, it probably makes sense just to use them on the publishing administration aggregator side as well. Um, but if you're using someone else for distribution, maybe not. Now with TuneCore and SongTrust, they just have one-time fees, TuneCore being $75, SongTrust being $100. Um, the admin fees, 15% across the board with all three of them, with the exception of TuneCore retains um, a 20% commission as it relates to sync. Some other terms that I just wanted to briefly mention as it relates to sync exclusivity, all of these companies are sync non-exclusive, except as it relates to social media monetization, meaning that you wouldn't be able to allow CD Baby to do your social media monetization like YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, and at the same time, let SongTrust do it too. Now, one thing I really have to do is applaud TuneCore for changing um, their terms because for the longest time, they were sync exclusive meaning that you wouldn't be able to uh, have a sync agent or hire another company to go out and pitch your music for um, you know, TV shows, films, et cetera. And so they've now made it non-exclusive and they deserve some applause for that because that's great that they changed that. Um, one thing I do wanna mention because I found that a lot of the time songwriters just aren't really aware of it. These companies, they're not actively pitching your music for ads or for TV, film, nothing like that. Um, I have worked um, on a music tech app in the past 
where I was actually looking to license music from various sources and approached both CD Baby and TuneCore. And basically what they did was when I told them, okay, well, I'm looking for uh, music that is more heavy on the vocals as opposed to instrumentals. And I'm looking for music in these four languages because they do have libraries set up that basically categorize songs based on you know, genre and language and things like that. They were then able to send me a list of songs to listen to and decide whether or not wanted to license them. So while they're not actively going out and pitching and placing, they do have systems whereby they can categorize songs. So if someone does approach them and say, hey, I'm looking for this for my project, um, your song could be included in that list. Um, other notable terms, one thing I did want to mention was with respect to derivative works. Um, in the event that someone was wanting to create a rearrangement of your song or an interpolation of your song, um, and they went to CD Baby or Song Trust and said, hey, I want to rearrange the song. CD Baby and Song Trust would come back to the songwriter and ask for permission first. Um, TuneCore does have exclusive rights to allow a party to create a derivative work of a song that is that they are representing. Um, now, I have been told by some people at TuneCore that they'll go back and ask songwriters for permission, but in their terms, it does say that they have the exclusive right to um, allow other parties to create derivative works. So next, we are going to move into social media monetization starting with YouTube. Now, with YouTube, YouTube refers to intellectual property as, quote, assets. So a song is referred to as, in the YouTube system, as a composition share asset. Sound recording, sound recording asset. And videos are either a music video asset, if it happens to be like an official music video, or um, an art track asset, which uh, think about when you're on YouTube and streaming a song and you just see like an album cover in the background. Um, that album cover, that, that's an art track. I think it's really helpful to understand just some of the YouTube tech basics because it will help you understand how monetization works on the platform and further, Basically, every other social media company has followed in the steps of YouTube and have created kind of similar technologies, not as good technologies, but similar technologies to um, assist right holders with managing their um, intellectual property on their platforms. So with YouTube, over time, rights holders have delivered their intellectual property to content ID. And as a result, each asset, IP, has its own unique digital DNA ascribed to it. Keep in mind, Content ID is the digital fingerprinting system that was developed by Google to identify and manage intellectual property on YouTube. So when someone uploads a video to YouTube, that video is scanned against all the files in YouTube's Content ID to see whether or not it contains any assets, IP, recognizable by Content ID. And so if the uploaded video does contain one of these assets, Content ID is then going to apply the policy um, that the asset owner has chosen regarding the use of the asset. So asset owners or managers that have access to YouTube's content management system can choose whether or not their assets, IP, are either monetized or blocked or tracked. And so in a circumstance where a video is uploaded and there's multiple um, assets, intellectual property in that video, and you have maybe like a record label that's chosen, they want their IP blocked and the music publisher has said, I want my IP monetized. YouTube is going to choose um, the strictest policy, which is block. And um, which in that case, it might be that the video is muted or you just can't see uh, the video at all. Now, some more information on YouTube. YouTube does have blanket licenses in place with the performing rights organizations, 
blanket licenses basically mean licenses that cover the entire catalog that they represent. So YouTube does have these licenses in place with the performing rights organizations. And as a result, performance royalties are owed on YouTube. Um, in addition, publishers, publishing administrators, and aggregators with content ID access can add the data pertaining to songs embodied in sound recordings in YouTube's content management system. So when parties upload videos with music and those videos actually qualify for monetization, um, then a portion of the ad revenue then flows back through to said publisher, to said publishing administrator or said aggregator um, who then will pay out that um, money to you as the songwriter. So as a result of publishers and administrators and aggregators having to add the data pertaining to the songs into specific sound recordings um, in YouTube's content management system, it means that the songs are tied to specific sound recording assets. And as a result, it makes it nearly impossible for YouTube's technology to detect user covers or like live covers of songs because a cover is a different recording. Um, so if I recorded myself on my phone singing Kate Bush is running up that hill, which you would not want to hear because my voice is terrible. Um, and that video was uploaded to YouTube. I uploaded it. Most likely, YouTube's content ID would not be able to catch that song um, because it's a different, um, it's a live version. It's going to differ in tempo and melody um, to some extent. And so it's different from the actual Kate Bush sound recording. And because of this issue, um, there are all sorts of problems as it relates to live streaming and you know live covers because they're not going to be detected by YouTube's content ID. And as a result, publishers are not going to be able to choose whether or not um, those uh, videos are monetized or blocked. And further, if the, if the technology can't actually track the song, then performance royalties aren't going to be able to be paid out for that public performance. Um, further, YouTube has um, what is known as Melody Match, which is tech that is supposed to um, address this issue. And, you know, all of this technology is really in its infancy. And so over time, I'm sure that this will be remedied. So some takeaways as it pertains to YouTube. If you are a self-published songwriter, you're a songwriter and you control your own publishing, and you want um, your song data to be in YouTube's content ID, you're going to have to use an aggregator if you don't have a publisher or another publishing administrator. And you're not going to be able to collect your publishing related revenue, like ad revenue, from third party videos being uploaded um, if you don't have an aggregator or administrator or publisher. One other thing to keep in mind, some aggregators only deal with the sound recordings, some only deal with the songs. So just keep in mind as you're looking at the terms and features of whatever aggregator that you might be using as you are self-releasing that if you do want to um, ensure that you are getting all the money that you're entitled to, that you do have um, these aggregators claiming on both um, the sound recording and the song. So I think it's interesting just to kind of look at what the ad revenue splits look like on YouTube. Whenever ads are run on a video and the video can actually be monetized, and mind you, videos can only be eligible for monetization if the video is on a channel that has 1,000 subscribers and 4,000 hours of watch time over a 12-month period. So in that case, um, ads run on a video, YouTube retains 45% of that ad revenue, and the creator ends up with 55%. And so when you have situations where there are multiple pieces of intellectual property in that video, that 55% is going to be split up accordingly. So in the instance of a music video, 
30% would end up with the owner of the sound recording asset, 15% would end up with um, the song, and 10% with the owner of the video. So um, that's just pertaining to the music video. When you're dealing with situations where there is a lot of music being used in one video, the calculations are going to be different. And YouTube, Google, not very transparent about anything. So um, not really sure how that's all calculated out, but it's gonna be some split up of the 55%. Um, so when you're looking at the features of these aggregators and what their terms are in connection with YouTube and other sorts of social media sources, understand that with CD Baby, they're going to retain 30% of the net income actually received um, from YouTube and other social media sources pertaining to both the sound recording and the songs. With TuneCore, they take a 25 uh, or they take a 20% commission on the sound recordings, 20% commission um, on the songs. And with SongTrust, they're only dealing with the songs. They're not dealing with distribution. They don't deal with the sound recordings and they take a 15% commission um, from the songs. And that's, you know, after various deductions, taxes and the like. So next we are going to move on to Facebook or Meta. Um, so Facebook does have licenses in place with the performing rights organizations, with um, major publishers and with um, publishing aggregators like CD Baby Publishing, TuneCore, SongTrust. Now, note that um, Facebook's licenses with um, the music publishers, at least the majors, they do cover sync for short form and longer form videos, meaning that if you are doing like a live stream performance and you're wanting to uh, perform um, a cover song, then you should be okay doing that. Uh, particularly if we're talking about a song that's really prominent, that's controlled by the major publishers. Now, Facebook does have its own kind of version of content ID, um, not as good as YouTube, but they do um, have their own uh, detection and management system. They do use a company called Audible Magic to deal with um, the blockings of uses of sound recordings. And then they do have their own rights manager, which is basically kind of like another version of YouTube's content management system. And just like with YouTube, covers just aren't detected on Facebook. So as I said, that if you are doing a live stream performance and in your performance, you're covering a song, um, because of these agreements that Facebook does have in place with music publishers, and also just because of the lack of detection technology, um, you know, you're probably going to be okay um, live streaming a cover recording. So as it relates to Facebook and Instagram monetization, CD Baby, TuneCore, and SongTrust all have agreements in place with Meta or Facebook. Um, in general, don't expect to see much money from these sources. Basically, when these social media companies um, enter into licenses with music publishers and with aggregators, they basically say X amount of dollars is the amount of money that we are going to allocate to songs for a specific time period. That song money bucket um, is then allocated to publishers via like market share methodology meaning that, you know, pretty much a lot of that money ends up in the hands of the major music publishers. Um, and then from there, the social media companies will provide periodic usage reports that then help the publisher or aggregator determine what to pay out to the songwriter. So, um, you know, ultimately not a lot of money here. And one thing that I've been told by a couple of publishers is that Facebook, um, Meta in general, is not really providing in-depth usage reports until a work has been used in a hundred unique videos. So, um, you know, just thought I would put that out there. And, you know, 
even though um, you know I'm saying not to expect much money, if any, from these sources, it can be important for some songwriters to be able to have their music out there to where if someone is wanting to use your music in their Instagram reels or in their stories, um, that you know some songwriters just want their music in the Facebook meta Instagram system so that can happen. So if that's the case, I totally understand it. Um, but I just want you all to be aware that there's just not much money there, particularly on the publishing side. Now, as it relates to TikTok, um, CD Baby, TuneCore, and SongTrust um, all have agreements in place with TikTok. And at least from what I've been told from a couple of publishers and based on what I've kind of recognized by looking at uh, royalty statements and cross-referencing with some of the data in TikTok, it appears that royalties are really payable based on users selecting your music for their video, not necessarily the number of views a video with your music might have. Um, so that's just something to keep in mind here. And like with Facebook, don't expect to see much money with TikTok. When cross-referencing um, a client's writer statement from BMI, um, it was pretty apparent that for um, approximately between like 1,200 and like 1,500 TikTok streams, which again, I think is means users selecting um, a particular song for their video, that 12 to 1,500 amount resulted in about $1 of performance royalties. So pretty bad. Um, and if you're a songwriter, um, I highly suggest like take a look at your statements from um, your performing rights organizations. If you're using an aggregator, um, check out your statements. If you have a publisher, look at your statements. Um, while it can be nearly impossible to really know whether or not you're being properly paid by these services, I think it's at least worth knowing, um, well, you know, okay, maybe 1,200 streams starts looking like the $1 range. I mean, I think it's really important information for people to know. So the takeaways here. Um, understand that as a songwriter, your songs need to be registered with a performing rights organization and with the MLC. Further, if you are a songwriter and you are going out and you're touring and performing your songs, please submit your set list to your performing rights organization. Otherwise, you're just leaving money on the table. Um, people will oftentimes ask me, well, I don't know, should I use an aggregator or not? I really don't have any options. It's not like I'm, I'm at the beginning of my career, so a publisher is not going to want to work with me now. I don't really know any publishing administrators to work with. It seems like aggregators are my only option. Should I use an aggregator? I usually ask a couple of questions. First question is, do you want to register your songs in multiple places? Um, if the answer is no, then have an aggregator just do this work for you. Um, further, do you care about collecting international mechanical royalties and publishing related revenue from social media, however small it might be? If the answer is yes, that you care about these things, and you don't have a publisher or you're not working with an administrator, then yes, you should use an aggregator to help you with this business management of your songs and collecting this money. So on that note, we are finished. And I am going to look through some of these questions here and see if we can answer them. Um, I see this question here, Gwen, at the beginning, um, maybe regarding mechanical is only for covers, correct? Um, no, so a mechanical royalty is owed to you as a songwriter, just when your song is streamed on streaming platforms, interactive streaming platforms like Spotify or um, Apple Music. So it's not just owed to you if someone is covering your song and releasing a, a new recording of your song. Let's see. Question. Oh, 
Question for the, ah, if I were to sign up with a publishing administrator, will they tap into any of my performance royalties? The answer is at least for CD Baby, TuneCore, and SongTrust, yes. Um, there were a few companies that were out there that were only dealing with um, the mechanicals um, and only taking commissions on the mechanicals, but at least as it pertains to CD Baby, TuneCore, and SongTrust, yes, they take their commission on your performance royalties. So I can understand the feeling of, well, that's not really fair because I can collect my publisher's share of performance royalties myself. Um, and that's true. But unfortunately, that is um, you know, how most of these major publishing administrator aggregators work. Second, if one has a song on a national commercial via a sync license, does the song also um, generate royalties when it's aired on TV or on the internet? Um, you know, ultimately, as it pertains to um, you know sync fees and royalties, you got to look at the actual license. But um, yes, it is possible. I'm registered with ASCAP, the MLC, and Kelphonic, which is similar to SongTrust. Does that cover everything or is it overkill? Um, you know, I would need to know a little bit more about Kelphonic um, and whether or not they have the ability or they use another service to actually um, uh, detect and get your music, get all of your um, work info into uh, like YouTube's content ID system and into these other sorts of social media uh, right systems and, you know, collect those social media royalties. But, um, you know, that's great that you're registered with ASCAP. Awesome that you're registered with the MLC. Um, and, you know, further to, I, I guess I would also be curious to know whether or not, you um, you register the titles with um, ASCAP and the MLC yourself um, and uh, or whether or not Killphonic uh, did it for you. But, um, you know, it sounds like you're on the right track. Is DistroKid considered an aggregator? Yes, it is. And but it's only an aggregator on the distribution side. It only deals with distribution. It does not deal with music publishing. So when we um, get to the presentation in two weeks where we talk about distribution, we will be spending quite a bit of time talking about DistroKid. Um, is that it? I think that's it. Well, thank you all very much, everyone. Um, I don't know if Elisa is going to come back here or if anyone else is going to pop back in here. Um, but I just wanted to say thank you all for joining tonight. And I hope that you all have at least learned some uh, new tips and tricks. And if you have any questions, um, feel free to reach out to Tala. And we will see you in two there weeks. questions. Hey, Gwen. Ron says there's another question real fast. A couple, of questions. A couple oh. of questions he said. Let me click back in. Oh, you have a sound scan question. I don't know if it's too much to cover or not, or if you skipped that, um, or if you just missed it. Oh, um, oh, where does sound scan fit into this mix? Um, so, you know, what I will say is I don't know that much about SoundScan. Um, you know, I know that they do have a tracking system that Billboard uses these numbers um, from their systems, but I, I really I really can't say much about that. Um, what I will do, though, is I will look into that and um, I will add a comment under the Tala YouTube video that will be available after the presentation. And you should find a comment where I answer that question in the next few days, because I also don't really know um, how the various aggregators work with SoundScan. But that is a great question. Let's see. 
looks like you have a question on a sink. Oh, hold on. I can think I can show it. There we go. Oh, if I were to land a sink deal on my own and I were signed up with an aggregator to do some of the aggregators split that deal. So, I mean, if you find a sync deal on your own and um, the party uh, ends up paying you the sync fee in whole, um, the question is, would CD Baby, would your aggregator know? Um, I don't know, probably not. They're dealing with so much stuff. They represent so many titles, probably not. Um, but, you know, when, when a music supervisor goes and looks up your title on BMI or ASCAP, it probably is going to say that the administration is being handled by CD Baby or TuneCore or whoever your administrator is. So it could be the case that um, that aggregator is reached out to first. But if we're talking about like a friend project, something that you just find on your own, um, then, you know, it's probably the case that they're, they're not going to know um, whether or not you got a sync fee and how much you were paid. All right, I'm going to grab this one last question from Sheila. Where should we be including our metadata if CD Baby, TuneCore Song Trust aren't actively pitching? but sending you categorized libraries. Um, I'm, you know what? I am going to post an email address in here where we can maybe talk offline about this because I'm also not exactly sure about the question that you're asking. And um, I think it might be easier if we um, talk about this offline. Okay, sounds great. Well, thank you so much, Gwen. This has been super helpful. And um, I, if you have other questions, you can feel free to email legal at, it's T-A-L-A-R-T-S dot org. Oh, Ron oops. or Gwen, could you fix yeah. that in the chat? Again, it's legal, L-E-G-A-L, at T-A-L-A-R-T-S dot org. If you've got some questions related to tonight's presentation, if you'll send them over there, I can't promise 100 percent, but we'll try to uh, get to any of them that we can related to tonight. Um, I just wanted to say again, thank you, Gwen, so much for being with us tonight. This has been so helpful. And thank you, Ron, for your work on the production end behind the scenes for tonight's event. Uh, please mark your calendars for part two of monetizing your music on July 13th. And don't forget to join AMF on the 12th to learn more about the MLC. And we will see you in a little over two weeks. Good night. <laughs>